All right. Thank you. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, green light is on. Awesome. So, hello, everybody. Thanks for the nice introduction. I'm Rami, and I'm so thrilled to be here in front of a live audience. I haven't done this for, for ages, to be honest. Um, and we'll talk about breaking changes in design system, uh, meaning changes that uh, the maintainers of the system uh, do uh, that require then the users of the system, meaning designers, uh, developers, uh, to change their way uh, of using the system. I have worked with various companies, uh, helping them with their design systems, and at the moment, as I said, I'm working as a consultant in a company called Asteroid. Um, and again, repeating, so I come from design side, uh, but I have also had my hands dirty with production code for uh, more than 10 years. Uh, I've been involved in uh, creating more than 1,000 different kind of releases for different design systems. Um, and early on, I actually didn't pay that much attention uh, to kind of the breaking, uh, breaking uh, matter of them and then the impact of the change that I'm actually doing. But uh, lately, I've been focusing more and more on that. So these are more like my reflections uh, during the maybe past about seven years of, uh, uh, and my observations on, on kind of uh, talking to various people about breaking changes in design system. So take everything that I say with a, with a grain of salt. If you disagree with, with me, that's perfectly okay. Uh, as all design systems are, are different and so might then be the approaches for the breaking changes. Um, but enough about me. So how many of you actually are using uh, a design system or a component library at the moment in your daily work? Ooh, nice. And is there anybody who is actually uh, maintaining or developing a design system? Oh, awesome. All right, so uh, let's go to the agenda. So I, I split um, these things into three different categories. Um, uh, so changes in process. Uh, in design and then in development. And I'm pretty sure there are definitely more areas in design system, um, but I would say these are the three that mostly relate into the breaking changes. Um, and as I only have about maybe 27 minutes to go, so I'll try to uh, skim through the first through, and as this is a developer conference, so I will focus mostly on, on the last thing. But if you are interested in the, in the first two, so I have plenty of ideas, so come and talk to me. So, breaking changes in process. When do they actually happen? Uh, I've split this into three. So I would say that breaking changes happen uh, in uh, communication. So when new channels are created, is it then Slack channels, Teams channels, whatnot, and then old ones are deprecated, or then recurring meetings are removed, whether then those being office hours or team code reviews or whatnot. So those will then affect the daily work. Then uh, documentation, so either then the platform uh, or the tool changes completely, or then the content inside those tools changes, or the documentation format or the place changes, or then the structure changes completely, so, so that it's uh, much harder to find, or something is removed. And then the last one being people are on the teams, so basically if there are larger uh, changes um, in, in the structure, uh, for instance, how how design system uh, team is formed. So is it actually uh, one team taking care of everything or is it actually a joint effort between the, between the development teams um, or design teams? Or then if the contribution model changes radically. So if, for instance, there has been somebody approving the pull request, for instance, for the component library and now it's a shared responsibility. So how do you act on those? I have just one clear answer. I think it's about uh, communicating these changes or over communicating these changes. So that's the really key. So whatever channels you have, uh, so then you can just use those and, and then really try to over communicate to overcome them. So it's, um, I would say, not simple as that, but that's at least one, one thing I've observed. So skimming through quickly, then going to design. And by design breakage, uh, I'm more focused on the kind of that you have current designs uh, and you have a design file, for instance, that you're using uh, or a UI kit. And then basically when you update to a newer version of this one, then your prototypes or layouts or screens break. And again, number three, I like three. Uh, so changes in toolkit, um, meaning uh, 
that you have kind of better tool in the market and that has like a um, better feature for instance or it's more quicker to create your um, your designs or your prototypes. Uh, I've been involved in moving from Adobe XD to Sketch and then also from Sketch to Figma lately and let's see now I guess uh, yesterday they uh, announced that um, Adobe bought Figma so maybe I've been moving from Figma to something else after that. Let's see. Uh, it takes a bit of time to master the tool, uh, so uh, you can either start with some zero release um, so that actually you can uh, easily create accidental breaking changes if you take a new tool into use uh, without realizing or then the structure is not complete in the beginning, so uh, letting it a bit of time to mature. Then second one being upgrades to the existing tools, um, meaning that there are actually new features uh, for, uh, for the tool that you are using, and then you hadn't anticipated uh, how, the, uh, how the structure uh, previously was for your components, for instance, and then uh, you need to migrate to new ones and then causing breakages for your components. Uh, for instance, Figma had, has introduced uh, features like variants, uh, auto layouting, and for instance, interactive components. And uh, it was pretty hard to then anticipate the kind of structure that they wanted for the components. So at least that has caused uh, breaking changes for me. Uh, then the third one being that the components are just not flexible enough. So as we learn new things and there are new patterns emerging, so the components of course evolve over time. And you can try to anticipate uh, either in design or also in code at the future. But of course no one has the crystal ball to understand uh, or know like what is the future. So sometimes it just hit the limits and then you need to restructure it in a way that actually creates breaking, uh, breaking changes. Uh, call me biased, uh, although my background is in design, I still feel that the tree sign is more, more transient than code. So I would say that just have your core designs up to date. So uh, um, main UIs that you have or the beginning points for your designs or current handovers that you are doing for, for the development teams. And then, of course, keeping then the rest hidden. I'd say it's nothing worse than bumping into, a, into an outdated design. Or actually, maybe it is, uh, bumping into an, um, uh, production code made from outdated designs. All right, then moving into breaking changes in development. Uh, I start uh, from uh, kind of low level, so about versioning, and I guess semantic versioning is the, is the thing that is used mostly. Uh, and so here what I'm talking about, I'm talking when you update then the, the first number, so the major, uh, in this one. So that's then called the breaking chains in semantic version, and I guess uh, pretty popular uh, used in many libraries. Uh, Eric Elliott has a, has a nice blog post, blog post about this one and, and I guess uh, it's a bit easier to understand if you name them a bit differently so having a breaking feature and fix so then you actually understand, understand what is there. So I guess many of the uh, front end frameworks uh, and other libraries use this one so if they claim that they're using semantic versioning that should be then trusted of course until proven otherwise. Then a bit about versioning your components. Um, I've seen at least three different approaches, or I've used three different approaches, there are probably many more, but just to trying to highlight then uh, how you can kind of uh, version your component library. So one being a monolithic thing, so I have created here an example of just a super simple uh, component library with three components, and basically having a button, but then you also have a card that depends on button, and then you have a list that is kind of separated. Uh, and basically in the monolithic approach, you're always releasing all of your components in one. Um, and of course, you will always then know the latest version because, well, everything is in one place. But then you're of course upgrading everything all the time, so is that then a good thing or a bad thing? Then you have coupled, uh, that's, that's maybe my term more, so I guess at least Lerna is using more like term called locked. Uh, but basically it's a kind of, um, that you have a running version in your component library, uh, and then for instance if you release a button with 1.1, and then you have a dependency for your, uh, for your card, so then you are basically releasing both of those with 1.1, but then you are actually uh, amending the version uh, of the whole library, so when you do a totally separate release of your list, you actually get a 1.2 for the minor release. But there is an exception here, uh, that when you actually do a major release, so then every, every component is then bumped uh, into two. And then you have independent versioning, um, or sometimes called also by component, uh, it's at least used by bit. 
So then you have kind of complete uh, independence of the releases, also with the major, major versions. So I guess here is then the, the differences for the major releases that in the independent part, uh, you are basically then creating uh, uh, this kind of independent releasing and then that can cause then problems for your release nodes. It's a solvable problem, but then you need to really understand how, what version your component is and then actually what is the latest version because then they will differ. For instance, having a version 2.1 for your card and, and, and maybe button and then maybe then the, the list is already in version 3. But all these have pros and cons, and, and I guess not taking a quick stance there, but I mean, I guess still, uh, I've been mostly using coupled, but then independent works too. All right, uh, let's do a test. I have never done anything like this uh, before, so I have no idea how this goes, but bear with me. So if all the people who are developers could raise their hands. Amazing, so many of you. And now, uh, all of those who are not using, keep your hands up, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, it's an exercise, it's an exercise. So all of you who are not using the latest version of your uh, front-end uh, library, then put your hand down. Okay, and then the last thing is, what about then if you're not using the latest major versions of all of your libraries, external or external, that you're using? So put your hand down now. Yeah. Yeah, so this is not to, not to blame you, but more like uh, understand like, uh, should you actually update all of your libraries? Uh, I'm not saying definitely you should not, but understanding that uh, you have like created a technical depth for yourself a bit. So there are terms like uh, long-term support, for instance. Um, so um, for instance, Node um, runs with those, uh, and then their latest long-term support version is 16. And actually, it's also the recommended version uh, for everybody. But then they actually have a, a newer version, uh, 18. So actually, they are not even recommending of updating to the latest, latest major version at the moment. So yeah. So then entering into impact of breaking changes. And I guess it's mostly uh, related to development teams spending uh, more time uh, and money in, in actually true work to update those uh, libraries. So, um, and of course, then this is away from, from development. Uh, so, mitigating, uh, so will then the mitigating of breaking changes actually increase customer value? That's always a good question. At least I tend to spend a lot of time um, uh, in evaluating if I get the breaking change, so from the release notes, understanding what is actually uh, breaking, even if my uh, build is green and my tests are passing. Um, and maybe I do even a bit of manual testing, just to be sure, because why didn't it break? And of course, in the situation is totally different uh, if something breaks, so then you really need to dig deeper and understand like uh, what actually broke and what is the solution to actually overcome this one, and it can then take hours to days to even weeks or even more to then mitigate this issue. So actually, what is then your update strategy uh, for your libraries? Um, do you do update only if there is something new that you need in your library? Or do you do only when you are forced one way or the other, so the long-term support, for instance, ends? Or do you do it uh, when you have security threats? Uh, so then at least that's something that usually forces you to think about it at least. Uh, the design systems are a bit special. Uh, I would say there are not that many um, security threats or kind of forcing changes, but more the pressure comes from within the organization. Of course, there can be new features there too, but more on actually understanding that uh, you would need to be on brand and, and then your UX would need to be unified, so then you actually uh, are kind of pressurized by the organization then to update. Then uh, one part uh, related to breaking changes is that the design system team, of course, needs to do more work, create the, uh, a change, uh, document the steps, do even migration scripts. Uh, part of that can be automated, but of course then there is a lot of manual labor related to that one too. Then if you have multiple uh, major versions running at the same time, uh, and you're running, for instance, in a micro front-end environment, so you can uh, easily bloat your bundle sizes. Uh, you can overcome minor and batch level uh, differences so that you will only have one version, but then you will at least have one version of each of your major versions there. And 
even if you are lazy loading your stuff, uh, to, to improve the perceived UX, the complexity will still be there anyways. And of course then, uh, if you have multiple major versions, you will have inconsistencies in your user experience. So you can have uh, interactions that are different or visuals that are different uh, throughout your application. And of course then the inconsistencies start from one, but they don't have an end. And of course it's, it's hard then to tell when this actually has a direct impact on, on user satisfaction. So when do breaking changes in development happen then? Uh, I guess it's mostly still about semantic versioning. Uh, so when you actually break your external API, meaning that property is removed, property is uh, changed, or then the type, type signature changes. Or then a special case where you have a component that is completely removed from the system. So that's of course a big change in the API. And then a uh, special part uh, related more to design system is and then uh, break it in visual, which Norbert already talked about. Uh, or then uh, other kind of uh, regression testings. So for instance, style, style tweaks cause your components to, uh, to break. Or, or then you have like tests in your, in your using end that are actually breaking, accessibility or unit test or whatnot. So let's just, uh, just check a, a really simple example. Uh, so um, all of that in mind, this simple example, it's written in uh, JSX as this is React conference. I guess we could also write it in in some other form, um, but here we go. So you have a, a button, and you didn't actually spend that much time in, in figuring out uh, the requirements for your button for futures. So you only made the small property. So you have a medium and a small variance for your button. But then there is a new requirement coming from the design side that actually you also need a large one. So then you decide to change uh, the button's property from small to size, and then actually make it um, like enable then uh, three different variants with that one, maybe with the default value. So is this a breaking change? It's not a trick question. Uh, by semantic versioning, of course it is. Uh, we are breaking the external API. It most definitely is. And then you can also think like uh, how big is the impact? So how many teams are actually using the small property or are impacted by this one? Uh, and how many are actually not? So maybe then the blast radius is actually pretty small. Um, and of course then if the teams are not using the small property at all, they should be able to uh, just update, um, update to the uh, latest major version. But of course then you might spend a bit of time in actually understanding why didn't actually my component break. And then if you give it a new, new version and then somebody is stuck on an older one for some reason, you actually need to then patch uh, the previous versions, uh, then creating uh, duplicate releases. But in an open system, uh, it is impossible to know all the usages. So we have uh, cool systems like Material UI or Ant Design and whatnot, and they are used by many people around the world, and, and the teams, of course, don't have access to all of the code that is created or, or using uh, these kind of systems. Um, so breaking changes tend to follow then the, the similar path that if you change the API, then it's a breaking change. But what if there is another way? So in a closed system, and I, I guess many design systems are, uh, uh, you could then maybe uh, understand um, that your code is basically uh, uh, findable from, from one central place, or if it's distributed in, in multiple repositories, for instance, so you should still access to all of the usages. Uh, in, a, in a code design system, uh, you should be able to know all of the teams that are actually using your system. So this could then enable a door for cheating. So what if the component is actually not used anymore? Or what if the property is not used anymore? Or what if you can actually verify from the using end from all of the instances that the visual regression testing actually doesn't, it breaks, but it doesn't actually break the component visuals that badly. Or then if you can actually know beforehand and then migrate uh, things. So then entering the analytics for uh, component code. So if you are uh, working with design system and haven't tried this, I really recommend you to try. It's a kind of low barrier thing to try out. And I think this is the kind of secret sauce for uh, closed design systems. So it's about knowing how your components are being uh, used or then again uh, misused. So actually then digging out from your usage, then to the code, then to your repository, then to your team, and actually then end, ending up in the uh, responsible person uh, you, uh, that has created or, or modified that part of the code. 
Uh, in the design side, at least in Figma, there is already this kind of thing. So they have analytics in place that you can actually see how many times your library components are being used and also how many times they are dis detached, meaning that you are kind of overriding your changes. But I haven't seen uh, in the code side uh, a nice or even any platform agnostic tool to actually make this thing happen. Um, so, but I mean, if you would know uh, all the versions that you have for your components, uh, all the usages of your properties, all the custom usages, or then the mal usages through your ecosystem that could then open up uh, different doorways. It doesn't take uh, that uh, much magical scripting kills, skills to then clone the repository, uh, so, um, but it's a diverse space, so um, building, building a reusable tool might be difficult, but I guess um, it's more of a question then to the community that could this kind of thing be built? There are tools like React Scanner uh, that can be used for React, and then I have seen also implementations, for instance, using Grafana to store the version, uh, versions of your used components throughout your uh, um, ecosystem, or then I've also seen a time series uh, representation using Influx or Prometheus to kind of sh uh, show how the component versions are, are like updating over time. Yeah, but anyways, uh, analytics are really beneficial to understand your, your system and how, how your code is used there, but they can also alleviate then uh, impacts of breaking changes. One side note before we go back to the, to the examples, so of course then you have also a concept called monorepo, uh, meaning that you can have uh, all your applications in one repository, including then your component library. And this kind of makes then the, the versioning or analytics of your component uh, much easier. Or there is kind of no versioning, but there still is the breaking changes. So if you change your component or break your button, uh, you are still breaking the button. There is no breaking change necessarily, but you, are, you still kind of have an uh, equal amount of work to be done, but it's just uh, shown immediately. So then the question is like, who will then do this? You can see all those changes all at once, but then do you actually then, uh, who will then update the whole system? Uh, is it then the design system team responsible of the breaking chains? I guess that's typical in monorepos, or uh, could it then be a shared responsibility? It's also a natural closed system, so it's really easy to find usages. Uh, and if something breaks, you can run the test with, with your uh, CI environment. And of course, then also verifying the usages can be much more simple. Of course, understanding then that the component library cannot be that easily shared outside, because it's kind of encapsulated inside the monorepo. Monorepo may have other issues, um, uh, and that's maybe a part of another talk, but at least it could uh, solve uh, quite a few of the hard problems related to a design system. So then going back to the button one more time. So let's try this one more time, and then we do the same change. So small button is changed to size, but now if we are actually inside a closed system, is this a breaking change? I would say actually now it becomes debatable. So what if nobody's actually using the small property? And we can know about that. So I would say that then it's actually not a breaking change anymore. If nobody is using the small property, although you are breaking your API, does it then matter? Or in an open system, uh, if you do this kind of uh, more complexity to your uh, component that you support both of your properties, I guess it doesn't make any sense. But in a closed system, if you have a plan that you are actually deprecating your small property and then doing a bit of JavaScript to actually support both of the properties at the same time, uh, when would you justify this kind of change? And I guess it then, then it actually becomes a number game. So how much effort your design systems team uh, will need to uh, use to make this uh, change in a non-breaking manner? In this case, it's simple, but it, of course, can be much more complicated in, in com more complex uh, scenarios. And then how much the using teams uh, will need to do to adapt uh, to the new size property? Of course, only the ones that are using it. Versus then if your design system team then makes a breaking change, and then the teams need to then spend time in actually updating it, bearing in mind that uh, all of the teams are then impacted by this one. So then it's actually back to the analytics to figure out and understand how the teams uh, are using it. And maybe you can create a spreadsheet out of this one and understand maybe the amounts are actually quite small. So then maybe it's justified. So uh, eventually, if you're actually doing this in a non-breaking manner and you can uh, follow through analytics how the teams are updating the components, then, then you can actually safely remove after a certain period of time then the property and no breaking chains happen. 
Then cases for uh, visual aversion testing breaking. Um, so I would say they are definitely breaking changes if you cannot verify on the using end if something broke. And I would say as a rule of thumb, uh, Nathan Curtis has written a nice blog post about this one, uh, but if it takes actually more space, uh, then there is a risk that the component might break. This also naturally depends, so, but I mean if you are adding your padding's margins or gaps, then there is a danger that something actually breaks. Of course, understanding that atomic components shouldn't have external uh, dependencies at all, uh, external uh, like sizing margins uh, outside. Um, but it's actually maybe not that an, uh, uh, a breaking change um, if you get a false positive from the regression testing. They are notoriously difficult to build in a real, reliable way, but it's still possible to do. Um, so of course this can happen. Uh, and or then if you actually reduce your um, component size requirements, of course then uh, being careful there if you remove, for instance, gap from your form, and then all of your four elements are actually collapsed, so it's probably a big breaking chains for how the form will look like. Uh, but if you can actually verify uh, that this thing didn't happen, so then, then it shouldn't be a breaking change. Uh, then you have not breaking changes, which actually you should have. So you shouldn't do breaking changes uh, accidentally. It has happened to me a couple of times, uh, to be honest, and, and, and uh, kind of created a minor release and thought nothing broke, but then, oops, uh, broke a couple of usages. And of course, this is then uh, highly dependent on trust on the system from the team's perspective, so you really need to then uh, like amend that, uh, get that trust back one way or the other. So if the teams cannot actually rely on semantic versioning, what can they then rely on? And then uh, another way uh, is that you deliberately do it, and then you just hope that nothing breaks. I would say that hope doesn't cut it here. You need proof. And that proof can be then in a form of regression testing or, or some other way that you can actually like uh, know uh, how the component is behaving in, in your ecosystem. Then you can build a bit of robustness uh, for your front ends to mitigate these issues. So you can write uh, uh, tests um, uh, that do not test the component either in our structures at all. Uh, so basically having only like business logic written in your components. And then you of course shouldn't have a, any nested style overrides done there for the internals of the components, so only in the allowed way that the design system enables you. And then uh, no snapshot testing should be done, I guess, anywhere, at least that's my stance. Uh, they are uh, kind, kind of creating such a false sense of security for you. And basically it's just breaking and then it's really hard to tell from the snapshot what actually changed or did something break or not. And then I would say that uh, no visual aggression testing should be done for complex components. Uh, Norbert may disagree with me, and that's, that's totally fine. Uh, but then at least for atomic components, if you have those in the front end, so naturally that, that's, a, that's a good thing and good kind of security measure. But then if you are taking snapshots of whole, all your application, uh, then that's a totally different thing. So when you do a breaking change, consider one more time uh, the impact of this one. Plan it beforehand. Uh, consider if you can actually group multiple into one. Of course, not delaying too many uh, or grouping too many of those that then you delay the initial uh, release altogether. Document all the needed steps uh, that you need to, to mitigate, to lower the barrier to update, uh, the more the merrier, but of course understanding that uh, it takes time to also build these uh, release notes and Slack pings and documentations and office hours and whatnot. Uh, consider uh, code modding. Uh, I guess Nick talked about this already yesterday. Uh, so plus one for that one. At uh, least I've been using uh, uh, JS Code Shift, which is uh, built by React, um, and pretty nice tool to kind of just create an AST script that then actually can mitigate uh, the breaking changes. That you can just run your script and then boom, the breaking change is gone. And then just monitor uh, your progress through analytics if you have that in place. Uh, and if the change is actually larger, then you can also create a spreadsheet uh, to understand then the magnitude of the change. I hope I didn't scare you too much or too badly uh, about creating breaking changes. So of course they are a natural part of, uh, of, of application development. But I, I hope I gave you a bit more, at least a, a bit of thinking uh, on can you actually uh, mitigate these things in the future. Thank you.